Hey, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, Kathy is an alumna of Chestnut Hill College. She graduated in the 1960s. Most of you have read or at least heard me talk about her moving in the other classes that we've had. Um, Kathy has worked at, Bell, well, worked at Bell Labs for over 30 years, and she's going to talk a little bit about her experience there. Um, I have questions that you guys asked that I gave her, so she might address those, or if you have more questions you want to ask later, just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic, mic over to you. She can see you, so off of the camera over there. So if you all want to wave. All right, Kathy, ready to start sharing? Uh, hi, everybody. Can you wave your hand so I can see that, that I'm looking at me? Okay, okay. It's, uh, it's dark, but I see you all. Okay. Okay, folks. Um, here we, we start. I'm going to talk about my days at Bell Labs. And I started in the late 60s through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. The pictures on the front I chose on purpose. The first one is what the comm centers, huge comm centers look like in those days with the uh, air conditioned floor that was raised about a foot and a half. And every once in a while you'd hit a tile that was shooting up cold air. Huge rooms. Um, the one on the right is the mini computers of the 70s and the early 80s, the famous Digital Equipment Corporation PDP line of 1170s and VAXs, which was the lifeblood of computing in the 70s. The bottom left is the 80s when cellular telecommunications took over, and I went into cellular in 86. Um, the middle is the secret of cellular telecommunications and how we can make it work. It's called the N of seven. Repeat, and we'll talk more about this if anybody wants to know. And finally, on the bottom far right is who I am now. I turn my head around and I am now a full-time artist. Okay, I just have to figure there's the thing. Okay, so today um, I'm going to talk about what the technology was like then. I give you a taste of a couple of technical issues that I had to work on uh, with original software development. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I got some closing comments um, on where Bell Libs is now from where it's in respect to where it was back in the 90s when I left. By the way, this is the flow charting template package that I used for eight years while I was doing software development. Okay, here we are, the early 60s. I'm third generation Bell System. I was born into the company. Uh, just like some kids are army brats. Well, I was a Bell System brat. Um, my summer jobs through college were always at New Jersey Bell. I was studying math and physics at CHC. I probably would have had a double major, except there wasn't one. And um, I took a job at Bell Labs, which was in the cards for me. Uh, and went on from there. In those days, it was all Fortran, assembly language. You wrote with sharpened pencils on coding pads that went to the Steno group where they got typed onto cards and you then submitted them to the mainframe and you got your paper printed output. The topic, the subject of my first job was military in a military research to develop a prototype compiler for a prototype parallel processing ensemble. Um, I was hired as a senior technical aide. And let me just tell you now that when you see something in blue <coughs> and um, italics, that is a reference to some of the challenges I had as a woman um, your professor asked me to point that out as I went along so that you had some sense of the history of uh, women in computing. So that's what that was. All the men were hired as members of technical staff, full members of technical staff. All the women were hired as technical aides, of course, with lower salaries. We worked side by side, however, and did the same job. My job was to write the compiler for the parallel Fortran language. I'll give you a sample of what that language looked like. Of course, this was all Department of Defense funding. And the whole point was to have uh, a system that could track 
warheads, nuclear warheads to separate the decoys from the, from the hot, the cold from the hot. We did this all in Fortran and assembly language. When your program didn't execute correctly, you got a core dump. I don't know if you guys have seen the 11 by 17 stacks of fanfold papers. They're legendary. Yes, that was us. That's what our desks look like. They were all numbers. If they came from the G machine, they were base eight octal. If they came from the IBM machine, they were base 16 EBCDICT, extended binary coded decimal. And you had to learn how to read that. In those days, I could read base two, base eight, base 10, and base 16, uh, a unique and um, fairly unuseful skill these days, probably. But it was all based on the power of zero and one, which is a theme throughout technology I kept bumping into. From a woman point of view, there was an executive, my boss's boss's boss, whom I had never met. He put a letter in my personnel file saying that he was convinced that I would not get beyond associate member of staff, which was a uh, like a bridesmaid kind of position, um, a consolation prize for not being an MTS, and that I wouldn't be there from three years on because I was likely to get pregnant and leave. And that he never even talked to me about it. It just showed up. It was just put in my file. Uh, in the meantime, here's the sample of what kind of technical memoranda, how you documented your work in the early 70s. You had to write technical memoranda, which were reviewed by a committee across the company to agree and sign off that you could publish it. This is the abstract for the compiler, the language that I worked on. And if you notice that I learned very early on um, to be gender neutral in what I did so that people would not know I was a woman because that had uh, negative effects. Hence, from that time on, I was known in Bell Laboratories as MK to Toronto on any publication. Okay, here's a sample. If you want to know what um, content addressable structures, what does a parallel language look like? I suspect, for instance, that Google and search and everything else uses these concepts um, as buried in, taken for granted uh, today, because that's really what all searching is all about. It's content addressing. But this was 1969, and this is what the commands look like. If you remember, if anybody's written code, you know, if then else, well, it was if one, if any, if all, if many. Um, you could float something. The difference between floated numbers and integer numbers were, just, were stored separately. I, I don't know why square root was a big deal. I guess maybe for Fourier transforms that were used to, to track uh, warheads. Um, move, evaluate, you could do searching on where, you could you could do things by sorting sequential, et cetera. So that's what the parallel language was all about, to be able to track warheads in each element. On the right is a sample of um, the algorithm I had to write to compile a parallel expression. Um, there was no utilities, no libraries, nothing off the shelf where you could go and just snatch some piece of code and have it added in. You had to develop the algorithm yourself, and then you had to code it. So that's this is a sample. I found it in a in a memo someplace. I thought it was interesting. I um, so that's what that is. Okay, now we move on to the early 70s. I was promoted to that consolation prize of MTS by bugging my supervisor for three years to get my case going. I was doing my master's, commuting at nights, a local university. Many of the men were offered one year on campus, not the women. Uh, in those, there was a little bit of IBM still left, but it was the end of the Cold War. And with the on with the coming in of, of com mini computing in various ways, people were starting to talk about mechanizing the records of the entire phone company, Bell System, across the country. 
remember this is pre-divestiture. This is the Bell System days. This is when there was P Pac Bell and New Jersey Bell and Bell of PA and, and all of them. And every record of everybody's phone in the whole country was on paper. Um, we started with some big IBM timeshare stuff, but that didn't really last. Uh, it was mini computer, it was the world of mini computers. And in fact, at this point, down in, in the research in Murray Hill, which was our Bell Labs building about 20 miles south of where I was, Unix was being written in assembly language. Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie were writing in assembly language. And I think it might have been Brian. Kernahan, I forget who it was that was developing the language to go with the new operating system. And the first one he did was A, and then the second one he did was B. And he finally got the third one with, that everybody liked, and it was C, and the name stuck. Um, my project to start to mechanize all the records of the Bell system, starting with the central offices and the local uh, phones and the local networks in the various towns uh, was commissioned to do it on. The, we started with the PDP 1145 and then with the 70 and then to the VAX. We got a copy of Unix from the, what I'd call the B time frame when it was written in assembly language. Uh, we would call up if, if our system guys, I remember Walt Costin would say, let me call down to Murray Hill and ask them if we needed some sort of utility. And I don't know how, if you guys are familiar with Unix and all of the Unix commands or not, um, but there was lots of commands we would need that, that didn't exist because the operating system was new. And so they'd call down to, to Ken or Dennis or somebody and say, what can you do about something like this? And those guys would write it and ship it up. And so I suspect much of what Unix turned out to be was was augmented by the needs of our real time uh, work that we were doing in Whippany. Of course, um, text editors was the ED, the line editor, and NROF and TROF to new roll off that was uh, was used to, to print to format print. There was no such thing as WYSIWYG editors. You did not. It was everything was line editors. And I don't know if any of you have ever read HTML or not, but um, if you are reading HTML, you're reading NROF, TROF with just a change of symbols. That's really what it really was. I can't believe that we're still using that. What is this, 30, 40 years later, but that it stuck. Um, we would work from home. I know some of you asked me how did I deal with with hours and amount of pressure and stuff. I thrived. I took a dial-up terminal home, which was a suitcase with an acoustic coupler, and you would stick your telephone handset into the coupler and dial, and you could sort of hear the go -go 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 as it connected. You had a keyboard and a fax-like printer but you had to be careful because it was heat sensitive. And so if you put your hot cup of coffee on it or a piece of toast at home, if you were having breakfast, it would turn black and you'd lose your printout. Um, we were all using deck machines. We had a big deck. And of course the PDP, the machines were like a row of kitchen cabinets, um, like refrigerator next to refrigerator, et cetera. And they were pretty big stuff. Um, what was interesting was we booted the system by flipping the switches on the front of the CPU cabinet. There were 16 switches and a couple of other ones, I forget. And you got to be good at, this is going back to your zeros and ones again, you got to be good with, with flipping the, the bits, zeros and ones, and um, that's how you booted the machine. We had mag tapes to load our software. We had the huge disk drives that were size of washing machines to held databases. And then we had the term, teletype terminals as the for the root user, the main controller into the system once you got it booted from the uh, from from the main console. The teletypes, I swear those teletype machines went back to the days of the telegraph. Um, they were electromechanical. They chugged along, you could feel them. They were just chug, 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 chug. Occasionally they would get stuck and you would just swat the side of the machine 
and it would get unstuck and then it would pick up and print again. You could run paper tape through it if you wanted. If you used it too much, the print head got wrong, got, got warm, and it would start to smoke. So you would say, oh, we got to leave it alone for a while. We certainly didn't want a fire in the computer room. So you'd walk away and let the teletype machine cool down. Okay, so now we're into the mid-70s. Computer science has finally become something of its own field in uh, academia. It wasn't, it had always been a stepchild in either a mathematics department or an electrical engineering department, but it was starting to become a major field. I was still, I took five years doing my master's at night. Um, so I was still chugging along, but you started to, to get a better sense of the integrity, not the integrity, but the intricacies and the brilliance of computer science, finite state automata, um, the idea of layered communications, which of course is the, is the bedrock of the whole internet and everything today. Logical thinking and designing, um, abstract logical thinking and designing versus up to then it had been hardware. People drew lines and boxes on paper. Um, with logical thinking and designing, you had to, to think abstractly. Shannon and information theory um, broke through the, was the foreground of information technology with entropy, the rules of uncertainty, probability, always the sublime elegance of the zero and the one. If you know that the maximum amount of information is contained when the probability is 0 0.5, 0 and 1. You don't know which maximum, maximum certainty, maximum amount of information. Love it. Okay, back to the practical. There's a picture of that disk that was going in that we would put into the washing machine. It had about eight, eight um, layers to it with a with a head that had eight arms and would slide in and out and read tops and bottoms. Um, this is where we had the expandable network database. You didn't have Microsoft Access or anybody's package. We wrote our own and developed. It was a network database, expandable. That was my job to uh, write all of that stuff. And it got to the point where with users, the beginnings of response time, that we would actually load the critical files, the ones of the heavy use files, in certain ways onto the disk first to minimize the time it took to transfer the data back to the software to the user because of the seek and latency time of the disk. The seek is the in and out movement to the right track and the latency is the spin. We measured those. So well, <clears throat> I'd been there a while at this point, so I did a lot of debugging of others. I helped them and I also spent, um, I went to the telco field sites, the, trial, the field trials any place from Passaic, New Jersey, um, to um, Beverly Hills, our second field trial was Beverly Hills, California. That was quite a, quite a place to go. Okay, so back on the, um, the women's side of it, at this point, I am now working for a supervisor that said, you know, to Toronto, you really ought to be an MTS um, because you've been working like one since the day you got here. And, so he put a package together and was given access to my personnel file where he found the letter that said I wasn't going to be there after three years. That was still in my file. It was, there it was. Um, and the, the way you got to be an MTS, if you were a woman, you had to go through a grilling of a cadre of four directors. Uh, like the director of computer research, the director of physics research. Grillia was like defending a, a PhD thesis uh, to see if I was technically fit. And wouldn't you know, the lead director of this committee turned out to be the same man that wrote the AMTS letter that said I wasn't going to be there for uh, after three years. So when I found out about that, blessedly, my supervisor took me aside and gave me a heads up. So I went and did a little bit of research on who the other three directors were. And it turns out that my good friend, 
shared an apartment with a woman who worked for one of them. So I called Lorinda and I said, tell me about Sam Morgan. And she told me he had three daughters. And I said, aha, there we go. That's that's my ace. So here I am in this grilling room in this in this office with a blackboard and four executive directors shooting questions at me about telephone company databases. I don't think they knew a thing about them. And um, at one point, Sam turns to me and he says, so now tell me about what you expect to do uh, with your career here at the labs. And I had practiced the reply and I have said something about working up to my uh, potential, looking for challenges, exciting job opportunities. And, and then I said, just like Sam, I'm sure you want for your daughters. And he stopped asking questions. He took a deep breath. He looked at the other three directors in the room. I never forget it. And he said to them, he said, you know, we came here to check her out. And you know what? My gosh, she checked us out. I think we're probably done. And that's when I got promoted to MTS. Okay, later in the 70s. Despite all of this politics, I was really, I'm really a tech head. I just, I love technology and I love elegance and simplicity. Even with my art now, um, there is much of that same thinking and approach. I have two examples I wanted to give you of what were the challenges of writing software for this kind of application back in the late 70s. Of course, we had this big database with customer records and that you had to search so that somebody in the phone company, like when you call 411 for a problem to report a problem, they could go and they could type in your phone number and it would come out and tell you all the pieces of equipment, cables, wires, jumpers, everything else in that mainframe office that was part of the circuit that made your phone work. And then they could go debug it. They could follow it through. They could find if, if a wire was loose or whatever the situation was, or if they needed to go change it or add it, or if you were moving and disconnected or whatever it was. Some of those circuits didn't have phone numbers. And the only way you could identify them was with these private, with these numbers, these codes. And in the initial database access, the only way to do that was to do sequential searching. And that was ridiculous because it, you could sit there for five or 10 minutes while the, you knew the database was spinning with seek and latency, pulling every record. Is it this the one to want? No, is that the one? No. So, so I decided I, I, I had to figure out what to do about it. And I said, well, how about I try a random number generator? and uh, a repeatable random number generator. And I think somebody in one of the questions, by the way, asked me, did we uh, work with other departments in other areas? Well, <clears throat> that was just natural. I picked up the phone, I called Murray Hill Research, I did the, the computer science guys. And then I said, maybe I should talk to the math guys. And I forget who I ended up talking to, but I said, I need a sample, I need a repeatable random number generator that if I always give it the same key, I will get the same number every time so that I could use that as a way to identify uh, and find these circuits in this database without sitting there spitting and sequentially searching. And they gave it to me. And it was a simple, straightforward thing. Keep it simple. Keep it elegant is, is how I love um, to do development. The other, the next example um, was, of course, I was taking, studying my master's, and um, we had had, oh, at this point, it probably was about two or three years old, someone had written code to scan the input. Uh, don't forget, in these days, we had no utilities, nothing. You sat there. And the operating system, you made an operating system call, and it gave you the next octal character coming in off the input stream, off the input port, which was somebody's terminal typing in a command. So you had to write software 
that could interpret every character that was typed in and execute the command, pull off the arguments that were with it, um, and then return the answers to the user. So I had, for some reason, I don't know why, but the finite state machine, Turing's Turing machine, the finite state autonomous hit me because I remember reading about it being a logical construct that was just had action and next state. That's all every item needed and you could run anything in, print, in some theoretical principle. So I said, ah, oh, that is perfect for a scanner. Every one of my, every character that comes in, I will have this big matrix that will search down the character. It will then search across to the state that the system is in at this very moment. I will then execute whatever action is appropriate for this, and I will assign it its next state. So I spent a couple of weeks designing this huge matrix on paper. And my boss, um, who had a PhD in mechanical engineering, why they made him a supervisor of software, I don't know, other than he was the graduated number one in this class at Berkeley in um, PhD in cement, concrete. He always talked about his having his feet in cement. Um, he had no concept of what this was, but I pursued it and I did it. And it was just amazing to actually take that concept of a logical finite state machine action in next state and turn it into this fun, to me, eventual project that would scan every input character. And if you developed a new command added to it, you simply added maybe some more um, states to the matrix and you didn't have to rewrite any other code. So that was that was another example of the kind of thing that we had to do in those days. So now we are at the end of the 70s, good news. That I say that was the last original software I ever was actually paid to work to write because I was promoted into technical supervision down into Honda, which is about 40 miles south of Whippany down towards the shore. Holmdale was the famous Aero Saarinen building. I don't know if you people have heard about it, the big giant glass building that was um, turned into Bell Works and is now a, a, a multi-use community down there once it was sold. And um, it even had a transistor shaped water tower. So if you ever for some reason, running, driving around down in Homedale, and you see this giant big white thing with three arms coming down. It is the water tower for Homedale in the shape of a giant transistor. Um, I was made supervisor of systems engineering, which wrote requirements for the software system that was developed in a sister department down there. That was the good news. The bad news is there were 4,000 people in Homedale. It was a city, uh, 4,000 people. And when I went there, I found four other women who were technical managers. The odds were a 1,000 to one for us. We just clung together. And I showed here, this is, I have to laugh now in, in hindsight. This was the lobby of the Homedale building, huge. This was just the lobby. You could fit 50 people sitting in those seats. This was all black granite. And that whole side wall, there were two doors at one end of that side wall. And they both were, rest, were bathrooms. Both of them had labeled men. There were no ladies' restrooms there. Gotta love Bell Labs in 1978. Okay. The 80s came along, more and bigger of the same. The I networks were starting to take hold. Um, somebody asked about projects, whether they worked or not. Um, there was a big project called ACS, which was a giant private network project, which actually it sort of it it was eventually stopped because it was just overwhelmed by technology and uh, the internet and networks popping up all over the place. It just it was just an idea whose time 
was passed. Um, mainframes were shrinking from relevance, except for the comptroller financial guys. Unix and C and C++ were universal. Uh, at and gave it away. Anybody could have it. Unix is the basis of MS-DOS. It's the basics of, basis of Linux. It's the basis of iOS. Uh, it was truly one of the best inventions that uh, at and Bell Laboratories ever came up with, in my opinion. The other thing that was started in that changed all of our lives completely is the cellular autoplex system. And at the same time, fiber optics were taking off as were continued uh, electronic miniaturization. I do not remember much, if anything, with satellite communications. Uh, it was all fiber optics. Satellite, of course, today is is the, the biggest thing going, but, um, but it is delivered to the home through fiber optics um, still. That is still part of technology today. Back on the women in technical management front, by then there was a couple of dozen of us women. We had grown from four to I don't know how many. But we organized ourselves, we self-trained, we brought in speakers, we would learn body language, power, how the system worked, et cetera. Um, we regularly confronted upper management. Um, we were relentless. And we men uh, mentored the next generation of women. Um, one of the things we learned to do was we would get together and we would say, Okay, what are you experiencing? What is what is what a boss is saying to you? What kind of things? And it turned out that many people, many of us were experiencing the same kinds of questions. So what we did was we would practice answers so that we could just come right back with the answer. And I always remember one of my favorite questions that um, we always had to answer was there was always some upper management male that just didn't get it at all. And they would always say, what do we, you women want? And we learned to simply look at him straight in the eye and say, your job. And that pretty much let him know where we were coming from. Um, the other thing that was happening in that time uh, was corporate was supporting encounter groups, three or five day off prem, 12 hour days uh, in a circle, 24 people, 18 men, six women addressing sexism. There was another one that was five days long that addressed, addressed racism in the workplace. Uh, amazing. Every male manager and tech management in Bell Laboratories was told to attend. There weren't that many women, so many of us were called on to go to many of them, and I actually did six of these workshops. Uh, my last one was with senior vice presidents and uh, executive directors, and that was that was probably the worst, the most harrowing of them all, because these were people, these were men who had the, the epitome of power at Bell Laboratories and had practiced it and just was slick and just amazing and had all of their buddies to support them. They all had the same line. And at one point, I remember we're in this circle. I don't know if you've ever been in an encounter group with a circle. It's just folded chairs and folding chairs in a circle. And all of a sudden, I find myself standing up in the circle all alone, and I, I was just exasperated. I don't know what I was doing. I was just a, telling somebody off, and I must have gotten really upset because all of a sudden, I was aware that there was a man standing right next to me who started to address the group and tell the men to stop, to pay attention, to listen, stop demeaning, stop, et cetera, et cetera. And I stopped talking and I let him finish. The facilitator then said, time for a break. And they all walked out. I went over to this person. This person was Arno Penzias, who, um, as in the Nobel Prize for the Big Bang, I went over to Arno and I said, Arno, how did you 
ever have the nerve to confront the senior VPs of the company. Um, and he looked at me and he said, Kathy, what are they going to do to a Nobel laureate? <laughs> and, and that sort of put it all in perspective. And so I thanked him very much. But my lesson I learned that day was, and I had a, I've had a couple of other men do the same thing, that when things get rough, the best thing if you're a guy and you want to work the issues with the women is to actually take their side and confront the men who have ganged up on her. Um, and that happened to me a couple of times, and this was an extraordinary one. Arno was an ex is an extraordinary man. Anyway, to the end of this, um, because at that point I was then promoted to department head in cellular, and we could talk about cellular for um, an age. The beauty of the N of seven reuse pattern is what made it possible, what makes it possible today. It, it, once again, the elegance of simplicity. And the women's part thing at the the, the higher level, the more they screamed. I would have I would have managers come in bullying, screaming me, screaming at me, which was just amazing that they would do that because it made them look like little little boys. But they did it anyway. Um, they seemed to feel that they had the right to do that. Um, I went from there into back into technical management of PC tools because me and my physics, I loved it. And then I went into uh, being quality director for the business unit. And the technology there is all about probability and statistics, the cost of quality. How do you how do you clean up your project? This was the beginning of Six Sigma. Uh, and I would go around to, to local colleges and give talks because it was becoming the big topic. And also at that point, encouraging women to enter into STEM. I did a lot of talks about that. And what basically the final word here is that I came to realize that original technical work didn't have to be just software or equations or printed circuit boards. It could be ideas put into words, something you think about. Remember that. Think it through. And finally, as fate would have it, the last year of my labs, every night walking past my office was that same man who wrote that letter 30 years before and who was the head of that grilling committee that had to give me MT, uh, MTS permission. And uh, and he walked past my office every single night. This kind of, it was pretty sad. And I don't think he ever knew who I was. Um, then I'll just real quick, you can read this. I graduated from the labs. I had planned ahead of time to do two things, to work with women, which I did pro bono, helping services, helping social services, women on welfare. And I studied, began my focus study on portraiture and then uh, plein air painting. And you'll see me out in fields today um, <clears throat> with my easel, plein air painting. I was president of the Pastel Society of Tampa Bay, Board of Governors at the Pastel Society of America, New York. And now I'm on their advisory boards for those two organizations. Okay. Wrapping up, here's where we're at. I told you I would tell you how Bell Labs was and is then and now. Then, Bell Labs, 1998, if you can see the date on here. Um, the world in the 90s uh, was all competitors, manufacturers. Everybody was, was going it alone, fighting everybody else. Cellular was a fad. It wasn't going to work. It was like the hula hoop. Fiber optics was king. Circuit switching was king. Packet switching was that data stuff. This was when we were in divestiture. Bell Labs had locations that were fiefdoms, hundreds of people that worked on all products, which became quickly legacy products within a year or two. Uh, there was rivalry, distrust. With divestiture, there was funding issues. It was a world that was not sustainable, which is actually eventually, of course, how it played out. And the methodology for project management was in its infancy. They still had people running projects that had their feet in hardware and just didn't understand uh, the cost of quality, manufacturing, uh, Six Sigma, the price to fix bad quality. And because uh, I was the quality director when we went for ISO 9000, 
certification. So I sort of saw it all the bloodbath firsthand. Um, but I, but once again, it was general systems theory leading to six sigma, and it was the beauty of the one and the zero, always probabilities. It's all based on probabilities. Um, <clears throat> I contacted a friend of mine who had been a peer at Bell Laboratories, who is now a senior vice president at Nokia, to ask him what's happening today. And Bell Labs today is back together as a wonderful company. It's owned by Nokia. It has pieces of all of those companies that were competitors way back and when, and they're all parts of Nokia Bell Laboratories today. They're distributed all over the world. Collaboration is essential. You don't have fiefdoms anymore. And it's my sense that this actually fosters collaboration, not to mentor, mention interacculturation, because isn't that what really the whole thing is? Get to know thy neighbor, get visit the tribes, get the tribes, know the other tribe, understand them that they're really just people like you. And I give Nokia a lot of credit for this um, because they seem to have an ethical focus based on equality and good business practices. The other thing I learned from Bill is that professionals today have an incredible project management, highly recoverable software control systems with trunks. They can run um, new runs, new systems every couple of times a day. It used to take us, we would do one every three to six months. And um, they have at levels today that I couldn't have imagined. And I didn't even begin to understand what it is. I just accept it. So in closing, I wanted to thank Bill Zucker, who is now a senior VP at Nokia, former peer, who encouraged me to do this lecture. And he gave me the helpful insight into what Bell Labs is today. OK. Thank you, Kathy. Back to you. What would you like? How do you want to go now? I'll let you be the MC from here on. OK. Does anybody have questions for Kathy before we say goodbye? I have answered a bunch of your questions if you want me to highlight any of them. Or I can send this to uh, your professor and she can hand it out to you. Questions, guys and gals? Anybody? I'm fixing if this. If there's microphone. one thing that you guys asked me over and over again from different aspects of it had to do with how did I stand up for myself? How was I as a woman? How did I deal with it? How did I break out of my weakness or, or whatever? Um, and what I wanted to share with you, and especially the women, is that I've never seen myself as weak that I don't believe any of you are weak. No one is weak. You simply have to learn how to project your strength. You have to believe in yourself. You project your strength with integrity, authenticity, not brute force, not like those vice presidents coming into my room screaming at me. Um, the other, you need to know your stuff. You don't fake it. Don't steal someone else's intellectual knowledge. Always acknowledge someone else's contribution. And women, learn how the system works. Find a mentor. Um, no one's watching out for number one, but number one, don't trust anybody else. And learn to stand your ground. Hold your own. Know, but know why you are right. Learn how to behave with ethical power and influence. But don't, and make sure everyone is treated with dignity. One other thing is be one step ahead, head them off and diffuse it if possible. Uh, so those are some of the thoughts I had. People asked me a lot about what did I think, what was my most challenge, what did I like most technical. You could probably tell that it oozes out of my pores. I love technical. Um, what Bell Laboratories, of course, when the vestiture, we lost funding. And it just went downhill. It, it was not sustainable. And only when Nokia actually stepped in, and Nokia has a high level of, of ethics a bar, um, that they brought it back together. And it sounds like a wonderful place today to work, except there aren't that many people in the United States. They're all over the world. Uh, I 
think that summarizes it as anybody, I'd love to have a comment from somebody. Anybody want to tell me what they think of all of this? How relevant is it? Is there any relevance to what you're going to face? Give me a little bit of, of insight here from you guys. Anybody want to see a couple of the room is is fairly dark and I really can't see faces. Yeah, I, I, I know, ones. Kathy. I'm sorry about that. Let me see if I can get it a little bit brighter. That's OK. Yes, I'm making it a little brighter, guys. Is that better, Kathy? Ah, ah, a few faces. I can only I can easily see the people that are wearing white there in the second row. <laughs> Trayvon. <laughs> Just and Oma. Clothes pick out. Um, Come on, somebody, give me some, some reaction. Tell me whether this may, oh, there's, there's oh. a hand. There's some hands. All right. When, Kathy, I got somebody. Okay. Hi, Kathy. My name is Barnabas, and thank you so much for your time. I got a couple of questions for you. Okay. So, how do you feel about the significant progress that has been made in the tech war today, now that there are many women being included, and also, have you attended any of the Grace Harper uh, Foundation, any of the conferences? Have you attended any of them, or do you intend attending any of them? So, uh, what what conferences again, Barnabas? It's I, the the Grace Harper Celebration Conference for Women in Tech. Oh, is there such a thing now? I've been out of tech a long time. So I don't know what they're doing, although Bill Zucker did tell me that at least at Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, they're re-igniting uh, um, the strength, strength, S-T-R-E-N-G-T, -E and then H-E-R, strengther um, group, which is probably a, a similar kind of thing to what you're talking about. Um, I applaud women and other cultures in technology, at least from the technology that I lived in in the 70s and 80s, because um, the technology was, uh, women, women bring another aspect to it. They don't bring the brute force. They don't, they're not likely to come into somebody's office and scream, close the door and scream at them. Um, there is a, a, a different approach and I also find that other cultures have a different approach too than the, um, the typical white male culture of the US. So, uh, so other, other races, ethnicities, um, I've always been pleased. I, I always, I, I encourage it and I think it enlarges and enriches the environment. Okay. Thank you. I hope Kathy. that answers your question, Barnabas. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, that was fine. Thank you so much. You're welcome, sir. Anybody else want to ask a question, real quick? We got any women in this group that want to give yeah. me some insight into we what have you're facing? Four or five in here right now, outside of myself and Professor Shaklowski. Anybody want to? Get that. Chase, Be Tiffany, right Anisha, Kelly, Breezy, you want to ask a question? Anisha, you asked a couple of questions in the questionnaire. I'm trying to see where your name was. Naoma, Trayvon. She had some really good questions, too. Yeah, I'm trying to, let's see. Oh, I forgot Noma. Sorry, Noma. Is that how you pronounce the name, Noma? I saw it in here. It was, it was an interesting name. I wasn't sure how to pronounce it. Uh, Anisha, I'm looking to see where Anisha is. Oh, never can find stuff in real time. Um, oh, there it was. Um, oh, you had one question about Bell Labs researchers were free to explore a diversity of topics. Um, what are the benefits of having researchers collaborate uh, and examples? Well, of course, I only know the world I was in and I talked about how I would collaborate and how we'd collaborate with the, with the math and computer people. Remember at that time, Bell Laboratories was 25,000 employees and anybody I called would help. Uh, 
I always got help. We collaborated. There was no reason to not collaborate. It was amazing collaboration. Um, I don't remember anybody not willing to help. And that reminds me of another question that was on here that I thought that I wanted to plant a seed with was, um, oh, someone said, if you worked with any famous, what famous scientists have you been able to work with and what have they taught you? And what I wanted to say is the culture of Bell Laboratories did not have famous scientists. We just had employees and whether they won a Nobel prize or they invented something or they got a patent and we got a patent, one patent every average one every, every day. No one um, went around wearing their accomplishments on their shoulder. It just, it just wasn't, just didn't do it. Um, so I, it's not like we had famous, I mean, I, I know Arno Penzias, he was a wonderful man, um, but he didn't, he didn't, didn't wear that out front in front of everybody. Um, Arno was one of, talk about, talk about minority groups. He was one of the five-year-old Jewish children in Germany when Hitler went in and his parents put him on the kinder train and shipped him to the UK. And he never saw his parents again. Um, remarkable, remarkable man. Um, so that's, that's something I wanted to mention. Someone asked me what was surprising to me at the labs. And I said the misogyny and chauvinism that we had to deal with. I was really surprised because I had been in six or eight years of women's education. Because holy, um, Chestnut Hill was all women at the time. Um, uh, somebody else wanted to know what comes to mind as significant impact on technology. Um, I mean, don't forget Bell Laboratories did Telstar, did the transistor, did cellular, Shannon's information theory, Unix and C. Um, those are all pretty major contributions. Thanks, and I Kathy. suspect that they are still doing the same thing going forward. Um, who knows when we're going to hear about the uh, Wi-Fi system for the moon. I suspect that that's probably closer than you think. Okay. Um, well, Kathy, thank you so much. It's, it's really appreciated you taking the time to talk to our students and really thank you again for sharing your experiences. Okay, and if anybody has any more questions, let me know and I will uh, gladly answer them. Okay. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys, and I wish I could have had a Grammy.